Section 41 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Perineum. The perineum corresponds to the outlet of the pelvis. Its deep boundaries are, in front, the pubic arch and the arcuate ligament of the pubis, behind the tip of the coccyx, and on either side the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium, and the sacrotuberous ligament. The space is somewhat lozenge-shaped, and is limited on the surface of the body by the scrotum in front, by the buttocks behind, and laterally by the medial side of the thigh. A line drawn transversely across in front of the ischial tuberosities divides the space into two portions. The posterior contains the termination of the anal canal, and is known as the anal region. The anterior, which contains the external urogenital organs, is termed the urogenital region. The muscles of the perineum may therefore be divided into two groups. 1. Those of the anal region. 2 those of the urogenital region, A in the male, B in the female. 1. The muscles of the anal region, corrugator cutis ani, sphincter ani externus, sphincter ani internus. The superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is very thick, areolar in texture, and contains much fat in its meshes. On either side a pad of fatty tissue extends deeply between the levator ani and obturator internus into a space known as the ischiorectal fossa. The deep fascia. The deep fascia forms the lining of the ischiorectal fossa. It comprises the anal fascia and the portion of the obturator fascia below the origin of levator ani. Ischiorectal fossa. Fossa ischiorectalis. The fossa is somewhat prismatic in shape, with its base directed to the surface of the perineum and its apex at the line of meeting of the obturator and anal fascia. It is bounded medially by the sphincter ani externus and the anal fascia, laterally by the tuberosity of the ischium and the obturator fascia, anteriorly by the fascia of collies covering the transversus perinei superficialis and by the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, posteriorly by the gluteus maximus and the sacrotuberous ligament. Crossing the space transversely are the inferior hemorrhoidal vessels and nerves. At the back part are the perineal and perforating cutaneous branches of the pudendal plexus, while from the forepart the posterior scrotal or labial vessels and nerves emerge. The internal pudendal vessels and pudendal nerve lie in Alcock's canal on the lateral wall. The fossa is filled with fatty tissue, across which numerous fibrous bands extend from side to side. The corrugator cutis ani. Around the anus is a thin stratum of involuntary muscular fiber which radiates from the orifice. Medially, the fibers fade off into the submucous tissue while laterally they blend with the true skin. By its contraction it raises the skin into ridges around the margin of the anus. The sphincter ani externus, external sphincter ani, is a flat plane of muscular fibers, elliptical in shape, and intimately adherent to the integument surrounding the margin of the anus. It measures about 8 to 10 centimeters in length, from its anterior to its posterior extremity and is about 2.5 centimeters broad, opposite the anus. It consists of two strata, superficial and deep. The superficial, constituting the main portion of the muscle, arises from a narrow tendinous band, the anococcygeal raphae, which stretches from the tip of the coccyx to the posterior margin of the anus. It forms two flattened planes of muscular tissue, which encircle the anus and meet in front to be inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, joining with the transversus perinei superficialis, the levator ani, and the bulbo cavernosus. The deeper portion forms a complete sphincter to the anal canal. Its fibers surround the canal, closely applied to the sphincter ani internus, and in front 
blend with the other muscles at the central point of the perineum. In a considerable proportion of cases, the fibers decusate in front of the anus, and are continuous with the transversi perinei superficiales. Posteriorly, they are not attached to the coccyx, but are continuous with those of the opposite side behind the anal canal. The upper edge of the muscle is ill-defined, since fibers are given off from it to join the levator ani. Nerve supply. A branch from the fourth sacral and twigs from the inferior hemorrhoidal branch of the pudendal supply the muscle. Actions. The action of this muscle is peculiar. 1. It is, like other muscles, always in a state of tonic contraction, and having no antagonistic muscle, it keeps the anal canal and orifice closed. 2. It can be put into a condition of greater contraction under the influence of the will, so as more firmly to occlude the anal aperture in expiratory efforts unconnected with defecation. 3. Taking its fixed point at the coccyx, it helps to fix the central point of the perineum, so that the bulbocavernosus may act from this fixed point. The sphincter ani internus, internal sphincter ani, is a muscular ring which surrounds about 2.5 centimeters of the anal canal. Its inferior border is in contact with, but quite separate from, the sphincter ani externus. It is about 5 millimeters thick, and is formed by an aggregation of the involuntary circular fibers of the intestine. Its lower border is about 6 millimeters from the orifice of the anus. Actions. Its action is entirely involuntary. It helps the sphincter ani externus to occlude the anal aperture and aids in the expulsion of the feces. 2. A. The muscles of the urogenital region in the male. Transversus perinei superficialis, bulbocavernosus, ischiocavernosus, transversus perinei profundus, sphincter urethrae membranaceae. Superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of this region consists of two layers, superficial and deep. The superficial layer is thick, loose, areolar in texture, and contains in its meshes much adipose tissue, the amount of which varies in different subjects. In front, it is continuous with the dartos tunic of the scrotum, behind with the subcutaneous areolar tissue surrounding the anus, and on either side, with the same fascia on the inner sides of the thigh. In the middle line, it is adherent to the skin on the raphe and to the deep layer of the superficial fascia. The deep layer of superficial fascia, fascia of collies, is thin, aponeurotic in structure, and of considerable strength, serving to bind down the muscles of the root of the penis. It is continuous in front with a dartos tunic, the deep fascia of the penis, the fascia of the spermatic cord, and scarpa's fascia upon the anterior wall of the abdomen. On either side it is firmly attached to the margins of the rami of the pubis and ischium, lateral to the crus penis, and as far back as the tuberosity of the ischium. Posteriorly, it curves around the transversi perinei superficialis to join the lower margin of the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. In the middle line, it is connected with the superficial fascia and with the median septum of the bulbocavernosus. This fascia not only covers the muscles in this region, but at its back part sends upward a vertical septum from its deep surface which separates the posterior portion of the subjacent space into two. The central tendinous point of the perineum. This is a fibrous point in the middle line of the perineum between the urethra and anus, and about 1.25 centimeters in front of the latter. At this point, six muscles converge and are attached, that is, the sphincter ani externus, the bulbocavernosus, the two transversi perinei superficialis, and the anterior fibers of the levatorius ani. The transversus perinei superficialis, transversus perinei, superficial transverse perineal muscle, is a narrow muscular slip which passes more or less transversely across the perineal space in front of the anus. It arises by tendinous fibers from the inner and forepart of the tuberosity of the ischium 
and, running medialward, is inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, joining in this situation with the muscle of the opposite side, with the sphincter ani externus behind, and with the bulbocavernosus in front. In some cases, the fibers of the deeper layer of the sphincter ani externus decusate in front of the anus and are continued into this muscle. Occasionally it gives off fibers which join with the bulbocavernosus of the same side. Variations are numerous. It may be absent or double, or insert into the bulbocavernosus or external sphincter. Actions the simultaneous contraction of the two muscles serves to fix the central tendinous point of the perineum. The bulbocavernosus, ejaculator urinae, accelerator urinae, is placed in the middle line of the perineum, in front of the anus. It consists of two symmetrical parts, united along the median line by a tendinous raphae. It arises from the central tendinous point of the perineum and from the median raphae in front. Its fibers diverge like the barbs of a quill pin. The most posterior form a thin layer, which is lost on the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. The middle fibers encircle the bulb and adjacent parts of the corpus cavernosum urethri, and join with the fibers of the opposite side on the upper part of the corpus cavernosum urethri, in a strong aponeurosis. The anterior fibers spread out over the side of the corpus cavernosum penis, to be inserted partly into that body, anterior to the ischiocavernosus, occasionally extending to the pubis, and partly ending in a tendinous expansion which covers the dorsal vessels of the penis. The latter fibers are best seen by dividing the muscle longitudinally, and reflecting it from the surface of the corpus cavernosum urethri. Actions This muscle serves to empty the canal of the urethra, after the bladder has expelled its contents, during the greater part of the act of micturition, its fibers are relaxed, and it only comes into action at the end of the process. The middle fibers are supposed by Krauss to assist in the erection of the corpus cavernosum urethri by compressing the erectile tissue of the bulb. The anterior fibers, according to Terrell, also contribute to the erection of the penis by compressing the deep dorsal vein of the penis as they are inserted into, and continuous with, the fascia of the penis. The ischiocavernosus, erector penis, covers the crust penis. It is an elongated muscle, broader in the middle than at either end, and situated on the lateral boundary of the perineum. It arises by tendinous and fleshy fibers from the inner surface of the tuberosity of the ischium behind the crust penis, and from the rami of the pubis and ischium on either side of the crust. From these points, fleshy fibers succeed and end in an aponeurosis, which is inserted into the sides and undersurface of the crust penis. Action. The ischiocavernosus compresses the crust penis and retards the return of the blood through the veins, and thus serves to maintain the organ erect. Between the muscles just examined, a triangular space exists, bounded medially by the bulbocavernosus laterally by the ischiocavernosus, and behind by the transversus perinei superficialis. The floor is formed by the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Running from behind forward in the space are the posterior scrotal vessels and nerves, and the perineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. The transverse perineal artery courses along its posterior boundary on the transversus perinei superficialis. The deep fascia. The deep fascia of the urogenital region forms an investment for the transversus perineae profundus and the sphincter urethri membranaceae, but within it lie also the deep vessels and nerves of this part, the whole forming a transverse septum, which is known as the urogenital diaphragm. From its shape it is usually termed the triangular ligament, and is stretched almost horizontally across the pubic arch so as to close, in the front part, the outlet of the pelvis. It consists of two dense membranous laminae, which are united along their posterior borders, but are separated in front by intervening structures. The superficial of these two layers, the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, is triangular in shape, 
and about four centimeters in depth. Its apex is directed forward, and is separated from the arcuate pubic ligament by an oval opening for the transmission of the deep dorsal vein of the penis. Its lateral margins are attached on either side to the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium, above the crust penis. Its base is directed toward the rectum, and connected to the central tendinous point of the perineum. It is continuous with the deep layer of the superficial fascia behind the transversus perinei superficialis, and with the inferior layer of the diaphragmatic part of the pelvic fascia. It is perforated, about 2.5 centimeters below the symphysis pubis, by the urethra, the aperture for which is circular and about 6 millimeters in diameter by the arteries to the bulb and the ducts of the bulbo-urethral glands, close to the urethral orifice, by the deep arteries of the penis, one on either side, close to the pubic arch, and about halfway along the attached margin of the fascia, by the dorsal arteries and nerves of the penis near the apex of the fascia. Its base is also perforated by the perineal vessels and nerves, while between its apex and the arcuate pubic ligament, the deep dorsal vein of the penis passes upward into the pelvis. If the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm be detached on either side, the following structures will be seen between it and the superior fascia. The deep dorsal vein of the penis, the membranous portion of the urethra, the transversus perinei profundus and sphincter urethrae membranaceae muscles, the bulbo-urethral glands and their ducts, the pudendal vessels and dorsal nerves of the penis, the arteries and nerves of the urethral bulb, and a plexus of veins. The superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm is continuous with the obturator fascia and stretches across the pubic arch. If the obturator fascia be traced medially after leaving the obturator internus muscle, it will be found attached by some of its deeper or anterior fibers to the inner margin of the pubic arch, while its superficial or posterior fibers pass over this attachment to become continuous with the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Behind, this layer of the fascia is continuous with the inferior fascia and with the fascia of collies. In front, it is continuous with the fascial sheath of the prostate, and is fused with the inferior fascia to form the transverse ligament of the pelvis. The transversus perinei profundus arises from the inferior rami of the ischium and runs to the median line, where it interlaces in a tendinous raphe with its fellow of the opposite side. It lies in the same plane as the sphincter urethrae membranaceae. Formerly, the two muscles were described together as the constrictor urethrae. The sphincter urethrae membranaceae surrounds the whole length of the membranous portion of the urethra, and is enclosed in the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Its external fibers arise from the junction of the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium to the extent of 1.25 to 2 centimeters, and from the neighboring fascia. They arch across the front of the urethra and bulbo-urethral glands, pass around the urethra, and behind it unite with the muscle of the opposite side by means of a tendinous raphe. Its innermost fibers form a continuous circular investment for the membranous urethra. Nerve supply. The perineal branch of the pudendal nerve supplies this group of muscles. Actions. The muscles of both sides act together as a sphincter, compressing the membranous portion of the urethra. During the transmission of fluids, they, like the bulbocavernosus, are relaxed, and only come into action at the end of the process to eject the last drops of the fluid. 2b. The muscles of the urogenital region in the female. Transversus perinei superficialis, bulbocavernosus, ischiocavernosus, transversus perinei profundus, sphincter urethrae membranaceae. The transversus perinei superficialis, transversus perinei, superficial transverse perineal muscle, in the female, is a narrow muscular slip, which arises by a small tendon from the inner and forepart of the tuberosity of the ischium, and is inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, 
joining in this situation with the muscle of the opposite side, the sphincter ani externus behind, and the bulbo cavernosus in front. Action. The simultaneous contraction of the two muscles serves to fix the central tendinous point of the perineum. The bulbo cavernosus, sphincter vaginae, surrounds the orifice of the vagina. It covers the lateral parts of the vestibular bulbs, and is attached posteriorly to the central tendinous point of the perineum, where it blends with the sphincter ani externus. Its fibers pass forward on either side of the vagina, to be inserted into the corpora cavernosa clitoridis, a fasciculus crossing over the body of the organ, so as to compress the deep dorsal vein. Actions. The bulbo cavernosus diminishes the orifice of the vagina. The anterior fibers contribute to the erection of the clitoris, as they are inserted into and are continuous with the fascia of the clitoris, compressing the deep dorsal vein during the contraction of the muscle. The ischio cavernosus, erector clitoridis, is smaller than the corresponding muscle in the male. It covers the unattached surface of the crust clitoridis. It is an elongated muscle, broader at the middle than at either end, and situated on the side of the lateral boundary of the perineum. It arises by tendinous and fleshy fibers from the inner surface of the tuberosity of the ischium, behind the crust clitoridis, from the surface of the crust, and from the adjacent portion of the ramus of the ischium. From these points fleshy fibers succeed and end in an aponeurosis, which is inserted into the sides and under surface of the crust clitoridis. Actions. The ischio cavernosus compresses the crust clitoridis, and retards the return of blood through the veins, and thus serves to maintain the organ erect. The fascia of the urogenital diaphragm in the female is not so strong as in the male. It is attached to the pubic arch, its apex being connected with the arcuate pubic ligament. It is divided in the middle line by the aperture of the vagina, with the external coat of which it becomes blended, and in front of this is perforated by the urethra. Its posterior border is continuous, as in the male, with the deep layer of the superficial fascia around the transversus perinei superficialis. Like the corresponding fascia in the male, it consists of two layers, between which are to be found the following structures the deep dorsal vein of the clitoris, a portion of the urethra and the constrictor urethra muscle, the larger vestibular glands and their ducts, the internal pudendal vessels, and the dorsal nerves of the clitoris, the arteries and nerves of the bulbi vestibuli, and a plexus of veins. The transversus perinei profundus arises from the inferior rami of the ischium and runs across to the side of the vagina. The sphincter urethrae membranaceae, constrictor urethrae, like the corresponding muscle on the male, consists of external and internal fibers. The external fibers arise on either side from the margin of the inferior ramus of the pubis. They are directed across the pubic arch in front of the urethra, and pass around it to blend with the muscular fibers of the opposite side, between the urethra and vagina. The innermost fibers encircle the lower end of the urethra. Nerve supply. The muscles of this group are supplied by the perineal branch of the pudendal. End of section 41. Of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Selena Arter. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. 7. The fascia and muscles of the upper extremity. A. The muscles connecting the upper extremity to the vertebral column. The muscles of this group are trapezius, latismus dorsi, Rhomboidius major, Rhomboidius minor, levator scapulae. Superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the back forms a layer of considerable thickness and strength, and contains a quantity of granular fat. It is continuous with the general superficial fascia. 
Deep fascia. The deep fascia is a dense fibrous layer attached above to the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone. In the middle line, it is attached to the ligamentum nuchae and supraspinal ligament and to the spinous processes of all the vertebrae below the seventh cervical. Laterally, in the neck, it is continuous with the deep cervical fascia. Over the shoulder, it is attached to the spine of the scapula and to the acromion, and is continued downward over the deltoideus to the arm. On the thorax, it is continuous with the deep fascia of the axilla and chest, and on the abdomen with that covering the abdominal muscles. Below, it is attached to the crest of the ilium. The trapezius is a flat, triangular muscle covering the upper and back part of the neck and shoulders. It arises from the external occipital protuberance and the medial third of the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone from the ligamentum nuchae, the spinous process of the seventh cervical, and the spinous processes of all the thoracic vertebrae, and from the corresponding portion of the supraspinal ligament. From this origin, the superior fibers proceed downward and lateralward, the inferior upward and lateralward, and the middle horizontally. The superior fibers are inserted into the posterior border of the lateral third of the clavicle, the middle fibers into the medial margin of the acromion, and into the superior lip of the posterior border of the spine of the scapula. The inferior fibers converge near the scapula and end in an aponeurosis, which glides over the smooth triangular surface on the medial end of the spine to be inserted into a tubercle at the apex of this smooth triangular surface. At its occipital origin, the trapezius is connected to the bone by a thin fibrous lamina, firmly adherent to the skin. At the middle, it is connected to the spinous processes by a broad semi-elliptical aponeurosis, which reaches from the sixth cervical to the third thoracic vertebrae and forms, with that of the opposite muscle, a tendinous ellipse. The rest of the muscle arises by numerous short tendinous fibers. The two trapezius muscles together resemble a trapezium, or diamond-shaped quadrangle. Two angles corresponding to the shoulders, a third to the occipital protuberance, and the fourth to the spinous process of the twelfth thoracic vertebra. Variations The attachments to the dorsal vertebrae are often reduced, and the lower ones are often wanting. The occipital attachment is often wanting. Separation between cervical and dorsal portions is frequent. Extensive deficiencies and complete absence occur. The clavicular insertion of this muscle varies in extent. It sometimes reaches as far as the middle of the clavicle and occasionally may blend with the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoideus or overlap it. The latissimus dorsi is a triangular, flat muscle which covers the lumbar region and the lower half of the thoracic region and is generally contracted into a narrow fasciculus at its insertion into the humerus. It arises by tendinous fibers from the spinous processes of the lower six thoracic vertebrae and from the posterior layer of the lumbodorsal fascia, by which it is attached to the spines of the lumbar and sacral vertebrae, to the supraspinal ligament, and to the posterior part of the crest of the ilium. It also arises by muscular fibers from the external lip of the crest of the ilium, lateral to the margin of the sacrospinalis, and from the three or four lower ribs by fleshy digitations, which are interposed between similar processes of the obliquus abdominus externus. From this extensive origin, the fibers pass in different directions, the upper ones horizontally, the middle obliquely upward, and the lower vertically upward, so as to converge and form a thick fasciculus which crosses the inferior angle of the scapula and usually receives a few fibers from it. The muscle curves around the lower border of the teres major and is twisted upon itself so that the superior fibers become at first posterior and then inferior, and the vertical fibers at first anterior and then superior. It ends in a quadrilateral tendon, 
about seven centimeters long, which passes in front of the tendon of the teres major and is inserted into the bottom of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Its insertion extends higher on the humerus than that of the tendon of the pectoralis major. The lower border of its tendon is united with that of the teres major, the surfaces of the two being separated near their insertions by a bursa. Another bursa is sometimes interposed between the muscle and the inferior angle of the scapula. The tendon of the muscle gives off an expansion to the deep fascia of the arm. Variations The number of dorsal vertebrae to which it is attached vary from four to seven or eight. The number of costal attachments varies. Muscle fibers may or may not reach the crest of the ilium. A muscular slip, the axillary arch, varying from seven to ten centimeters in length and from 5 to 15 millimeters in breadth, occasionally springs from the upper edge of the latissimus dorsi about the middle of the posterior fold of the axilla and crosses the axilla in front of the axillary vessels and nerves to join the undersurface of the tendon of the pectoralis major, the coracobrachialis, or the fascia over the biceps brachii. This axillary arch crosses the axillary artery, just above the spot usually selected for the application of a ligature and may mislead the surgeon during the operation. It is present in about 7% of subjects and may be easily recognized by the transverse direction of its fibers. A fibrous slip usually passes from the lower border of the tendon of the latissimus dorsi near its insertion to the long head of the triceps brachii. This is occasionally muscular and is the representative of the dorso epitrochlearis brachii of apes. The lateral margin of the latissimus dorsi is separated below from the obliquus externus abdominis by a small triangular interval, the lumbar triangle of Pettit, the base of which is formed by the iliac crest and its floor by the obliquus internus abdominis. Another triangle is situated behind the scapula. It is bounded above by the trapezius, below by the latissimus dorsi, and laterally by the vertebral border of the scapula. The floor is partly formed by the rhomboideus major. If the scapula be drawn forward by folding the arms across the chest and the trunk bent forward, parts of the sixth and seventh ribs and the interspace between them become subcutaneous and available for osculation. The space is therefore known as the triangle of osculation. Nerves. The trapezius is supplied by the accessory nerve and by branches from the third and fourth cervical nerves, the latissimus dorsi by the sixth, seventh, and eighth cervical nerves through the thoracodorsal, long subscapular, nerve. The rhomboideus major arises by tendinous fibers from the spinous processes of the second, third, fourth, and fifth thoracic vertebrae and the supraspinal ligament, and is inserted into a narrow tendinous arch attached above to the lower part of the triangular surface at the root of the spine of the scapula, below to the inferior angle, the arch being connected to the vertebral border by a thin membrane. When the arch extends, as it occasionally does, only a short distance, the muscular fibers are inserted directly into the scapula. The rhomboideus minor arises from the lower part of the ligamentum nuque and from the spinous processes of the seventh cervical and first thoracic vertebrae. It is inserted into the base of the triangular smooth surface at the root of the spine of the scapula and is usually separated from the rhomboideus major by a slight interval, but the adjacent margins of the two muscles are occasionally united. Variations The vertebral and scapular attachments of the two muscles vary in extent. A small slip from the scapula to the occipital bone close to the minor occasionally occurs. The rhomboideus occipitalis muscle The levator scapulae 
levator anguli scapulae, is situated at the back and side of the neck. It arises by tendinous slips from the transverse processes of the atlas and axis from the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the third and fourth cervical vertebrae. It is inserted into the vertebral border of the scapula between the medial angle and the triangular smooth surface at the root of the spine. Variations The number of vertebral attachments varies. A slip may extend to the occipital or mastoid, to the trapezius, scalene, or serratus anterior, or to the first or second rib. The muscle may be subdivided into several distinct parts from origin to insertion. Levator claviculae from the transverse processes of one or two upper cervical vertebrae to the outer end of the clavicle corresponds to a muscle of lower animals, more or less union with the serratus anterior. Nerves. The rhomboid eye are supplied by the dorsal scapular nerve from the fifth cervical, the levator scapulae by the third and fourth cervical nerves, and frequently by a branch from the dorsal scapular. Actions. The movements effected by the preceding muscles are numerous, as may be conceived from their extensive attachments. When the whole trapezius is in action, it retracts the scapula and braces back the shoulder. If the head be fixed, the upper part of the muscle will elevate the point of the shoulder, as in supporting weights. When the lower fibers contract, they assist in depressing the scapula. The middle and lower fibers of the muscle rotate the scapula, causing elevation of the acromion. If the shoulders be fixed, the trapezii acting together will draw the head directly backward or if only one act, the head is drawn to the corresponding side. When the latissimus dorsi acts upon the humerus, it depresses and draws it backward, and at the same time rotates it inward. It is the muscle which is principally employed in giving a downward blow, as in felling a tree or in saber practice. If the arm be fixed, the muscle may act in various ways upon the trunk. Thus, it may raise the lower ribs and assist in forcible inspiration. Or, if both arms be fixed, the two muscles may assist the abdominal muscles and pectoralis in suspending and drawing the trunk forward, as in climbing. If the head be fixed, the levator scapulae raises the medial angle of the scapula. If the shoulder be fixed, the muscle inclines the neck to the corresponding side and rotates it in the same direction. The rhomboid eye carry the inferior angle backward and upward, thus producing a slight rotation of the scapula upon the side of the chest. The rhomboidus major acting especially on the inferior angle of the scapula, through the tendinous arch by which it is inserted. The rhomboid eye acting together with the middle and inferior fibers of the trapezius will retract the scapula. End of section 42. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 43 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Selena Arter. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The muscles connecting the upper extremity to the anterior and lateral thoracic walls. The muscles of the anterior and lateral thoracic regions are pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, subclavius, serratus anterior, superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the anterior thoracic region is continuous with that of the neck and upper extremity above, and of the abdomen below. It encloses the mamma and gives off numerous septa which pass into the gland, supporting its various lobes. From the fascia over the front of the mamma, fibrous processes pass forward to the integument and papilla. These were called by Sir A. Cooper the ligamenta suspensoria. 
Pectoral Fascia The pectoral fascia is a thin lamina covering the surface of the pectoralis major and sending numerous prolongations between its fasciculi. It is attached in the middle line to the front of the sternum, above to the clavicle, laterally and below it is continuous with the fascia of the shoulder, axilla, and thorax. It is very thin over the upper part of the pectoralis major, but thicker in the interval between it and the latissimus dorsi, where it closes in the axillary space and forms the axillary fascia. It divides at the lateral margin of the latissimus dorsi into two layers, one of which passes in front of and the other behind it. These proceed as far as the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae to which they are attached. As the fascia leaves the lower edge of the pectoralis major, to cross the floor of the axilla, it sends a layer upward under cover of the muscle. This lamina splits to envelop the pectoralis minor, at the upper edge of which it is continuous with the coracoclavicular fascia. The hollow of the armpit, seen when the arm is abducted, is produced mainly by the traction of this fascia on the axillary floor, and hence the lamina is sometimes named the suspensory ligament of the axilla. At the lower part of the thoracic region of the deep fascia is well developed, and is continuous with the fibrous sheaths of the recti abdominis. The pectoralis major is a thick, fan-shaped muscle situated at the upper and fore part of the chest, it arises from the anterior surface of the sternal half of the clavicle, from half the breadth of the anterior surface of the sternum, as low down as the attachment of the cartilage of the sixth or seventh rib, from the cartilages of all the true ribs, with the exception frequently of the first or seventh, or both, and from the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus abdominis. From this extensive origin, the fibers converge toward their insertion. Those arising from the clavicle pass obliquely downward and lateralward, and are usually separated from the rest by a slight interval. Those from the lower part of the sternum, and the cartilages of the lower true ribs, run upward and lateralward, while the middle fibers pass horizontally. They all end in a flat tendon, about five centimeters broad, which is inserted into the crest of the greater tubercle of the humerus. This tendon consists of two laminae, placed one in front of the other, and usually blended together below. The anterior lamina, the thicker, receives the clavicular and the uppermost sternal fibers. They are inserted in the same order as that in which they arise, that is to say, the most lateral of the clavicular fibers are inserted at the upper part of the anterior lamina. The uppermost sternal fibers pass down to the lower part of the lamina, which extends as low as the tendon of the deltoideus and joins with it. The posterior lamina of the tendon receives the attachment of the greater part of the sternal portion and the deep fibers, i.e., those from the costal cartilages. These deep fibers, and particularly those from the lower costal cartilages, ascend the higher, turning backwards successively behind the superficial and upper ones, so that the tendon appears to be twisted. The posterior lamina reaches higher on the humerus than the anterior one, and from it an expansion is given off, which covers the intertubercular groove and blends with the capsule of the shoulder joint. From the deepest fibers of this lamina at its insertion, an expansion is given off, which lines the intertubercular groove, while from the lower border of the tendon a third expansion passes downward to the fascia of the arm. Variations The more frequent variations are greater or less extent of attachment to the ribs and sternum, varying size of the abdominal part or its absence, greater or less extent of separation of sternocostal and clavicular parts, fusion of clavicular part with deltoid, decussation in front of the sternum, Deficiency or absence of the sternocostal part is not uncommon. Absence of the clavicular part is less frequent. Rarely the whole muscle is wanting. Costocoracoideus is a muscular band occasionally found arising from the ribs or aponeurosis of the external oblique between the pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi and inserted into the coracoid process. Chondroepitrochlearis is a muscular slip occasionally found arising from the costal cartilages or from the aponeurosis of the external oblique below the pectoralis major or from the pectoralis major itself. 
The insertion is variable on the inner side of the arm to fascia, intermuscular septum, or internal condyle. Sternalis. In front of the sternal end of the pectoralis major, parallel to the margin of the sternum, it is supplied by the anterior thoracic nerves and is probably a misplaced part of the pectoralis. Coracoclavicular fascia. Fascia coracoclavicularis. Costocoracoid membrane. Clavipectoral fascia. The coracoclavicular fascia is a strong fascia situated under cover of the clavicular portion of the pectoralis major. It occupies the interval between the pectoralis minor and subclavius and protects the axillary vessels and nerves. Traced upward, it splits to enclose the subclavius and its two layers are attached to the clavicle, one in front of and the other behind the muscle. The latter layer fuses with the deep cervical fascia and with the sheath of the axillary vessels. Medially, it blends with the fascia covering the first two intercostal spaces and is attached also to the first rib medial to the origin of the subclavius. Laterally, it is very thick and dense and is attached to the coracoid process. The portion extending from the first rib to the coracoid process is often whiter and denser than the rest and is sometimes called the costocoracoid ligament. Below this, it is thin and at the upper border of the pectoralis minor it splits into two layers to invest the muscle. From the lower border of the pectoralis minor it is continued downward to join the axillary fascia, and lateralward to join the fascia over the short head of the biceps brachii. The coracoclavicular fascia is pierced by the cephalic vein, thoracochromial artery and vein, and external anterior thoracic nerve. The pectoralis minor is a thin, triangular muscle situated at the upper part of the thorax beneath the pectoralis major. It arises from the upper margins and outer surfaces of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs, near their cartilage and from the aponeuroses covering the intercostalis. The fibers pass upward and lateralward and converge to form a flat tendon, which is inserted into the medial border and upper surface of the coracoid process of the scapula. Variations Origin from second, third, and fourth or fifth ribs. The tendon of insertion may extend over the coracoid process to the greater tubercle, may be split into several parts. Absence rare. Pectoralis minimus. First rib cartilage to coracoid process. Rare. The subclavius is a small triangular muscle placed between the clavicle and the first rib. It arises by a short, thick tendon from the first rib and its cartilage at their junction, in front of the costoclavicular ligament. The fleshy fibers proceed obliquely upward and lateralward to be inserted into the groove on the undersurface of the clavicle between the costoclavicular and conoid ligaments. Variations Insertion into coracoid process instead of clavicle or into both clavicle and coracoid process. Sternoscapular fasciculus to the upper border of scapula. Sternoclavicularis from manubrium to clavicle between pectoralis major and coracoclavicular fascia. The serratus anterior, serratus magnus, is a thin muscular sheet situated between the ribs and the scapula at the upper and lateral part of the chest. It arises by fleshy digitations from the outer surfaces and superior borders of the upper eight or nine ribs, and from the aponeuroses covering the intervening intercostales. Each digitation, except the first, arises from the corresponding rib. The first springs from the first and second ribs, and from the fascia covering the first intercostal space. From this extensive attachment, the fibers pass backward, closely applied to the chest wall, and reach the vertebral border of the scapula, and are inserted into its ventral surface in the following manner. The first digitation is inserted into a triangular area on the ventral surface of the medial angle. The next two digitations spread out to form a thin, triangular sheet the base of which is directed backward and is inserted into nearly the whole length of the ventral surface of the vertebral border. 
The lower five or six digitations converge to form a fan-shaped mass, the apex of which is inserted, by muscular and tendinous fibers, into a triangular impression on the ventral surface of the inferior angle. The lower four slips interdigitate at their origins with the upper five slips of the obliquus externus abdominis. Variations Attachment to tenth rib Absence of attachments to first rib to one or more of the lower ribs. Division into three parts. Absence or defect of middle part. Union with levator scapulae. External intercostals or external oblique. Nerves. The pectoralis major is supplied by the medial and lateral anterior thoracic nerves. Through these nerves, the muscle receives filaments from all the spinal nerves entering into the formation of the brachial plexus. The pectoralis minor receives its fibers from the eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves through the medial anterior thoracic nerve. The subclavius is supplied by a filament from the fifth and sixth cervical nerves. The serratus anterior is supplied by the long thoracic, which is derived from the fifth, sixth, and seventh cervical nerves. Actions If the arm has been raised by the deltoideus, the pectoralis major will, conjointly with the latissimus dorsi and teres major, depress it to the side of the chest. If acting alone, it adducts and draws forward the arm, bringing it across the front of the chest and at the same time rotates it inward. The pectoralis minor depresses the point of the shoulder, drawing the scapula downward and medialward toward the thorax and throwing the inferior angle backward. The subclavius depresses the shoulder, carrying it downward and forward. When the arms are fixed, all three of these muscles act upon the ribs, drawing them upward and expanding the chest, and thus becoming very important agents in forced inspiration. The serratus anterior, as a whole, carries the scapula forward and at the same time raises the vertebral border of the bone. It is therefore concerned in the action of pushing. Its lower and stronger fibers move forward the lower angle and assist the trapezius in rotating the bone at the sternoclavicular joint, and thus assist this muscle in raising the acromion and supporting weights upon the shoulder. It is also an assistant to the deltoideus in raising the arm, inasmuch as during the action of this latter muscle it fixes the scapula and so steadies the glenoid cavity on which the head of the humerus rotates. After the deltoideus has raised the arm to a right angle with the trunk, the serratus anterior and the trapezius, by rotating the scapula, raise the arm into an almost vertical position. It is possible that when the shoulders are fixed, the lower fibers of the serratus anterior may assist in raising and everting the ribs, but it is not the important inspiratory muscle it was formerly believed to be. End of section 43. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 44 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fasci of the Shoulder. In this group are included deltoideus, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, teres major. Deep Fascia. The deep fascia covering the deltoideus invests the muscle and sends numerous septa between its fasciculi. In front it is continuous with the fascia covering the pectoralis major, behind where it is thick and strong with that covering the infraspinatus, above it is attached to the clavicle, the acromion, and the spine of the scapula, below it is continuous with the deep fascia of the arm. The deltoideus, deltoid muscle, is a large, thick, triangular muscle which covers the shoulder joint in front, behind, and laterally. It arises from the anterior border and upper surface of the lateral third of the clavicle, from the lateral margin and upper surface of the acromion, 
and from the lower lip of the posterior border of the spine of the scapula, as far back as the triangular surface at its medial end. From this extensive origin the fibers converge toward their insertion, the middle passing vertically, the anterior obliquely backward and lateralward, the posterior obliquely forward and lateralward. They unite in a thick tendon which is inserted into the deltoid prominence on the middle of the lateral side of the body of the humerus. At its insertion the muscle gives off an expansion to the deep fascia of the arm. This muscle is remarkably coarse in texture and the arrangement of its fibers is somewhat peculiar. The central portion of the muscle, that is to say, the part arising from the acromion, consists of oblique fibers. These arise in a bipeniform manner from the sides of the tendinous intersections, generally four in number, which are attached above to the acromion and pass downward parallel to one another in the substance of the muscle. The oblique fibers thus formed are inserted into similar tendinous intersections, generally three in number, which pass upward from the insertion of the muscle and alternate with the descending septa. The portions of the muscle arising from the clavicle and spine of the scapula are not arranged in this manner, but are inserted into the margins of the inferior tendon. Variations. Large variations uncommon. More or less splitting common. Continuation into the trapezius, fusion with the pectoralis major, additional slips from the vertebral border of the scapula, infraspinous fascia and axillary border of scapula not uncommon. Insertion varies in extent, or rarely is prolonged, to origin of brachioradialis. Nerves. The deltoideus is supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical through the axillary nerve. Actions. The deltoideus raises the arm from the side so as to bring it at right angles with the trunk. Its anterior fibers, assisted by the pectoralis major, draw the arm forward, and its posterior fibers, aided by the teres major and latissimus dorsi, draw it backward. Subscapular fascia. Fascia subscapularis. The subscapular fascia is a thin membrane attached to the entire circumference of the subscapular fossa, and affording attachment by its deep surface to some of the fibers of the subscapularis. The subscapularis is a large triangular muscle which fills the subscapular fossa and arises from its medial two-thirds and from the lower two-thirds of the groove on the axillary border of the bone. Some fibers arise from tendinous laminae which intersect the muscle and are attached to ridges on the bone, others from an aponeurosis which separates the muscle from the teres major and the long head of the triceps brachii. The fibers pass lateralward and, gradually converging, end in a tendon which is inserted into the lesser tubercle of the humerus and the front of the capsule of the shoulder joint. The tendon of the muscle is separated from the neck of the scapula by a large bursa which communicates with the cavity of the shoulder joint through an aperture in the capsule. Nerves. The subscapularis is supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical nerves through the upper and lower subscapular nerves. Actions. The subscapularis rotates the head of the humerus inward. When the arm is raised, it draws the humerus forward and downward. It is a powerful defense to the front of the shoulder joint, preventing displacement of the head of the humerus. Supraspinatus fascia. Fascia supraspinata. The supraspinatus fascia completes the osseofibrous case in which the supraspinatus muscle is contained. It affords attachment by its deep surface to some of the fibers of the muscle. It is thick medially, but thinner laterally under the caracoacromial ligament. The supraspinatus occupies the whole of the supraspinatus fossa, arising from its medial two-thirds and from the strong supraspinatus fascia. The muscular fibers converge to a tendon which crosses the upper part of the shoulder joint and is inserted into the highest of the three impressions on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The tendon is intimately adherent to the capsule of the shoulder joint. Infraspinatus fascia, fascia infraspinata. The infraspinatus fascia is a dense fibrous membrane covering the infraspinatus muscle and fixed to the circumference of the infraspinatus fossa. It affords attachment by its deep surface to some fibers of that muscle. It is intimately attached to the deltoid fascia along the overlapping border of the deltoideus. The infraspinatus is a thick triangular muscle which occupies the chief part of the infraspinatus fossa. It arises by fleshy fibers from its medial two-thirds and by tendinous fibers from the ridges on its surface. It also arises from the infraspinatus fascia which covers it and separates it from the teredes major and minor. The fibers converge to a tendon which glides over the lateral border of the spine of the scapula 
and passing across the posterior part of the capsule of the shoulder joint, is inserted into the middle impression on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The tendon of this muscle is sometimes separated from the capsule of the shoulder joint by a bursa, which may communicate with the joint cavity. The teres minor is a narrow elongated muscle which arises from the dorsal surface of the axillary border of the scapula for the upper two-thirds of its extent, and from two aponeurotic laminae, one of which separates it from the infraspinatus, the other from the teres major. Its fibers run obliquely upward and lateralward, the upper ones in an tendon which is inserted into the lowest of the three impressions on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The lowest fibers are inserted directly into the humerus immediately below this impression. The tendon of this muscle passes across and is united with the posterior part of the capsule of the shoulder joint. Variations. It is sometimes inseparable from the infraspinatus. The teres major is a thick but somewhat flattened muscle, which arises from the oval area on the dorsal surface of the inferior angle of the scapula, and from the fibrous septa interposed between the muscle and the teres minor and infraspinatus. The fibers are directed upward and lateralward, and end in a flat tendon about five centimeters long, which is inserted into the crest of the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The tendon at its insertion lies behind that of the latissimus dorsi, from which it is separated by a bursa, the two tendons being, however, united along their lower borders for a short distance. Nerves the supraspinatus and infraspinatus are supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical nerves through the suprascapular nerve, the teres minor by the fifth cervical through the axillary, and the teres major by the fifth and sixth cervical through the lowest subscapular. Actions. The supraspinatus assists the deltoideus in raising the arm from the side of the trunk and fixes the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity. The infraspinatus and teres minor rotate the head of the humerus outward, they also assist in carrying the arm backward. One of the most important uses of these three muscles is to protect the shoulder joint, the supraspinatus supporting it above, and the infraspinatus and teres minor behind. The teres major assists the latissimus dorsi in drawing the previously raised humerus downward and backward, and in rotating it inward. When the arm is fixed, it may assist the pectoralis and the latissimus dorsi in drawing the trunk forward. End of section 44 of Gray's Anatomy, part 2. Section 45 of Gray's Anatomy, part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and fascia of the arm. The muscles of the arm are caracobrachialis, brachialis, biceps brachii, triceps brachii. Brachial fascia, fascia brachii, deep fascia of the arm. The brachial fascia is continuous with that covering the deltoidus and the pectoralis major by means of which it is attached above to the clavicle, acromion, and spine of the scapula. It forms a thin, loose, membranous sheath for the muscles of the arm, and sends septa between them. It is composed of fibres disposed in a circular or spiral direction, and connected together by vertical and oblique fibres. It differs in thickness at different parts, being thin over the biceps brachii, but thicker where it covers the triceps brachii, and over the epicondyls of the humerus. It is strengthened by fibrous aponeurosis, derived from the pectoralis major and latimus dorsi medially, and from the deltoideus laterally. On either side it gives off a strong intermuscular septum, which is attached to the corresponding supracondylar ridge and epicondyle of the humerus. The lateral intramuscular septum extends from the lowest part of the crest of the greater tubercle along the lateral supracondylar ridge to the lateral epicondyle. It is blended with the tendon of the deltoideus, gives attachment to the tricep brachii behind, to the brachialis, brachioradialis, 
an extensa carpi radialis longus in front, and is perforated by the radial nerve and profunda branch of the branchial artery. The medial intermuscular septum, thicker than the preceding, extends from the lower part of the crest of the lesser tubercle of the humerus below the teres major, along the medial supracondylar ridge to the medial epicondyle. It is blended with the tendon of the corocobrachialis and affords attachment to the triceps brachii behind and the brachialis in front. It is perforated by the ulnar nerve, the superior ulnar collateral artery, and the posterior branch of the inferior ulnar collateral artery. At the elbow, the deep fascia is attached to the epicondyles of the humerus and the olecranon of the ulna, and is continuous with the deep fascia of the forearm. Just below the middle of the arm, on its medial side, is an oval opening in the deep fascia, which transmits the basilic vein and some lymphatic vessels. The corocobrachialis, the smallest of the three muscles in this region, is situated at the upper and medial part of the arm. It arises from the apex of the coracoid process, in common with the short head of the biceps brachii, and from the intermuscular septum between the two muscles. It is inserted by means of a flat tendon into an impression at the middle of the medial surface and border of the body of the humerus, between the origins of the triceps brachii and brachialis. It is perforated by the muscular cutaneous nerve. Variations A bony head may reach the medial epicondyle. A short head, more rarely found, may insert into the lesser tubercle. The biceps brachii, biceps biceps flexor cubiti, is a long fusiform muscle placed on the front of the arm and arising by two heads, from which circumstance it has received its name. The short head arises by a thick flattened tendon from the apex of the coracoid process, in common with the coracobrachialis. The long head arises from the supraglenoid tuberosity at the upper margin of the glenoid cavity, and is continuous with the glenoidal labrum. This tendon, enclosed in a special sheath of the synovial membrane of the shoulder joint, arches over the head of the humerus. It emerges from the capsule through an opening close to the humeral attachment of the ligament, and descends into the intertubercular groove. It is retained in the groove by the transverse humeral ligament, and by a fibrous prolongation from the tendon of the pectoralis major. Each tendon is succeeded by an elongated muscular belly, and the two bellies, although closely applied to each other, can readily be separated until within about 7.5 centimetres of the elbow joint. Here they end in a flattened tendon, which is inserted into the rough posterior portion of the tuberosity of the radius, a bursa being interposed between the tendon and the front part of the tuberosity. As the tendon of the muscle approaches the radius, it is twisted upon itself, so that its anterior surface becomes lateral and is applied to the tuberosity of the radius at its insertion. Opposite the bend of the elbow, the tendon gives off, from its medial side, a broad aponeurosis, the lacutus fibrosus, bicipital fascia which passes obliquely downward and medialward across the brachial artery and is continuous with the deep fasci covering the origins of the flexor muscles of the forearm. Variations A third head, 10%, to the biceps brachii is occasionally found, arising at the upper and medial part of the brachialis, with the fibres of which it is continuous and inserted into the lacitus fibrosus and medial side of the tendon of the muscle. In most cases, this additional slip lies behind the brachial artery and its course down the arm. In some instances, the third head consists of two slips, which pass down, one in front and the other behind the artery, concealing the vessel in the lower half of the arm. More rarely, a fourth head occurs, arising from the outer side of the humerus, from the intertubercular groove, or from the greater tubercle. Other heads are occasionally found. 
slips sometimes pass from the inner border of the muscle over the brachial artery to the medial intermuscular septum, or the media epicondyle, more rarely to the pronator teres or brachialis. The long head may be absent or arise from the intertubercular groove. The brachialis, brachialis anticus, covers the front of the elbow joint and the lower half of the humerus. It arises from the lower half of the front of the humerus, commencing above at the insertion of the deltoideus, which it embraces by two angular processes. Its origin extends below to within 2.5 centimetres of the margin of the articular surface. It also arises from the intermuscular septum, but more extensively from the medial than the lateral. It is separated from the lateral below by the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. Its fibres converge to a thick tendon, which is inserted into the tuberosity of the ulna and the rough depression on the anterior surface of the coronoid process. Variations. Occasionally doubled. Additional slip to the supernata, pronata teres, biceps, lacitus fibrosus, or radius are more rarely found. Nerves. The choreobrachialis, biceps brachii, and brachialis are supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. The brachialis usually receives an additional filament from the radial. The coracobrachialis receives its supply primary from the seventh cervical, the biceps brachii, and the brachialis from the fifth and sixth cervical nerves. Actions. The choreobrachialis draws the humerus forward and medialward, and at the same time assists in retaining the head of the bone in contact with the glenoid cavity. The biceps brachii is a flexor of the elbow, and to a lesser extent of the shoulder. It is also a powerful supinator, and serves to render tense the deep fasciae of the forearm, by means of the lacitus fibrosus given off from its tendon. The brachialis is a flexor of the forearm, and forms an important defence to the elbow joint. When the forearm is fixed, the biceps brachii and brachialis flex the arm upon the forearm, as in efforts of climbing. The triceps brachii, triceps, triceps extensor cubiti, is situated on the back of the arm, extending the entire length of the dorsal surface of the humerus. It is of a large size, and arises by three heads, long, lateral and medial, hence its name. The long head arises by a flattened tendon from the infraglenoid tuberosity of the scalpula, being blended at its upper part with the capsule of the shoulder joint. The muscular fibres pass downward between the two other heads of the muscle, and join with them in the tendon of insertion. The lateral head arises from the posterior surface of the body of the humerus, between the insertion of the teres minor and the upper part of the groove for the radial nerve, and from the lateral border of the humerus and the lateral intermuscular septum. The fibres from this origin converge towards the tendon of insertion. The medial head arises from the posterior surface of the body of the humerus, below the groove for the radial nerve, it is narrow and pointed above, and extends from the insertion of the teres major to within 2.5 centimetres of the trochlea. It also arises from the medial border of the humerus, and from the back of the whole length of the medial intramuscular septum. Some of the fibres are directed downward to the olecranum, while others converge to the tendon of insertion. The tendon of the triceps brachii begins about the middle of the muscle. It consists of two aponeurotic laminae, one of which is subcutaneous and covers the back of the lower half of the muscle. The other is more deeply seated in the substance of the muscle. After receiving the attachment of the muscular fibres, the two lamellae join together above the elbow and are inserted for the most part into the posterior portion of the upper surface of the olecranon. A band of fibres is, however, continued downward on the lateral side over the anconius to bend with the deep fasciae of the forearm. 
The long head of the triceps brachii descends between the teres minor and teres major, dividing the triangular space between these two muscles and the humerus into two smaller spaces, one triangular, the other quadrangular. The triangular space contains the scapular circumflex vessels. It is bounded by the teres minor above, the teres major below, and the scapular head of the triceps laterally. The quadrangular space transmits the posterior humeral circumflex vessels and the axillary nerve. It is bounded by the teres minor and capsule of the shoulder joint above, the teres major below, the long head of the triceps brachii medially, and the humerus laterally. Variations A fourth head from the inner part of the humerus, a slip between triceps and latimus dorsi corresponding the dorso epitrochialis. The subanconius is the name given to a few fibres which spring from the deep surface of the lower part of the triceps brachii and are inserted into the posterior ligament and synovial membrane of the elbow joint. Nerves. The triceps brachii is supplied by the seventh and eighth cervical nerves through the radial nerve. Actions. The triceps brachii is the great extensor muscle of the forearm and is the direct antagonist of the biceps brachii and brachialis. When the arm is extended, the long head of the muscle may assist the teres major and latissimus dorsi in drawing the humerus backward and in abducting it to the thorax. The long head supports the under part of the shoulder joint. The subanconius draws up the synovial membrane of the elbow joint during extension of the forearm. End of section 45。Section 46 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray The Muscles and Fascia of the Forearm The Muscles and Fascia of the Forearm Antibrachial Fascia, Fascia Antibrachii, Deep Fascia of the Forearm the antibrachial fascia, continuous above with the brachial fascia, is a dense membranous investment, which forms a general sheath for the muscles in this region. It is attached, behind, to the olecranon and dorsal border of the ulna, and gives off from its deep surface numerous intermuscular septa, which enclose each muscle separately. Over the flexor tendons, as they approach the wrist, it is especially thickened, and forms the volar carpal ligament. This is continuous with the transverse carpal ligament, and forms a sheath for the tendon of the palmaris longus, which passes over the transverse carpal ligament to be inserted into the palmar aponeurosis. Behind, near the wrist joint, it is thickened by the addition of many transverse fibers, and forms the dorsal carpal ligament. It is much thicker on the dorsal than on the volar surface, and at the lower than at the upper part of the forearm, and is strengthened above by tendinous fibers derived by the biceps brachii in front, and from the triceps brachii behind. It gives origin to muscular fibers, especially at the upper part of the medial and lateral sides of the forearm and forms the boundaries of a series of cone-shaped cavities in which the muscles are contained. Besides the vertical septa separating the individual muscles, transverse septa are given off both on the volar and dorsal surfaces of the forearm, separating the deep from the superficial layers of muscles. Apertures exist in the fascia for the passage of vessels and nerves. One of these apertures, of large size, 
situated at the front of the elbow, serves for the passage of a communicating branch between the superficial and deep veins. The antibrachial or forearm muscles may be divided into a volar and a dorsal group. The volar antibrachial muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group, pronator teres, palmaris longus, flexor carpe radialis, flexor carpe ulnaris, flexor digitorum sublimus. The muscles of this group take origin from the media epicondyle of the humerus by a common tendon. They receive additional fibers from the deep fascia of the forearm near the elbow and from the septa which pass from this fascia between the individual muscles. The pronator teres has two heads of origin, humeral and ulnar. The humeral head, the larger and more superficial, arises immediately above the medial epicondyle and from the tendon common to the origin of the other muscles, also from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor carpe radialis and from the antibrachial fascia. The ulnar head is a thin fasciculus which arises from the medial side of the coronoid process of the ulna and joins the proceeding at an acute angle. The median nerve enters the forearm between the two heads of the muscle and is separated from the ulnar artery by the ulnar head. The muscle passes obliquely across the forearm and ends in a flat tendon which is inserted into a rough impression at the middle of the lateral surface of the body of the radius. The lateral border of the muscle forms the medial boundary of a triangular hollow situated in front of the elbow joint and containing the brachial artery, median nerve, and tendon of the biceps brachii. Variations. Absence of ulnar head. Additional slips from the medial intermuscular septum from the biceps and from the brachialis anticus occasionally occur. The flexor carpi radialis lies on the medial side of the preceding muscle. It arises from the medial epicondyle by the common tendon, from the fascia of the forearm, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the pronator teres laterally the palmaris longus medially, and the flexor digitorum sublimus beneath. Slender and aponeurotic in structure at its commencement, it increases in size and ends in a tendon which forms rather more than the lower half of its length. This tendon passes through a canal in the lateral part of the transverse carpal ligament and runs through a groove on the greater multangular bone. The groove is converted into a canal by fibrous tissue and lined by a mucous sheath. The tendon is inserted into the base of the second metacarpal bone and sends a slip to the base of the third metacarpal bone. The radial artery in the lower part of the forearm lies between the tendon and this muscle and the brachioradialis variations. Slips from the tendon of the biceps, the lacertus fibrosus, the coronoid, and the radius have been found. Its insertion often varies and may be mostly into the annular ligament, the trapezium, or the fourth metacarpal as well as the second or third. The muscle may be absent. The palmaris longus is a slender fusiform muscle lying on the medial side of the proceeding. It arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles, and from the antibrachial fascia. It ends in a slender, flattened tendon, which passes over the upper part of the transverse carpal ligament, and is inserted into the central part of the transverse carpal ligament 
and lower part of the palmar aponeurosis, frequently sending a tendinous slip to the short muscles of the thumb. Variations. One of the most variable muscles in the body. This muscle is often absent about 10% and is subject to many variations. It may be tendinous above and muscular below, or it may be muscular in the center with a tendon above and below, or it may be present two muscular bundles with a central tendon, or finally it may consist solely of a tendinous band. The muscle may be double. Slips of origin from the coronoid process or from the radius have been seen. Partial or complete insertion into the fascia of the forearm, into the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris and pisiform bone, into the navicular, and into the muscles of the little finger have been observed. The flexor carpi ulnaris lies along the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises by two heads, humeral and ulnar connected by a tendinous arch, beneath which the ulnar nerve and posterior ulnar recurrent artery pass. The humeral head arises from the media epicondyl of the humerus by the common tendon. The ulnar head arises from the medial margin of the olecranon and from the upper two-thirds of the dorsal border of the ulna by an aponeurosis common to it and the extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum profundus, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum sublimus. The fibers end in a tendon which occupies the anterior part of the lower half of the muscle and is inserted into the pisiform bone. It is prolonged from this to the hamate and fifth metacarpal bones by the pisohamate and pisometacarpal ligaments. It is also attached by a few fibers to the transverse carpal ligament. The ulnar vessels and nerve lie on the lateral side of the tendon of this muscle, in the lower two-thirds of the forearm. Variations Slips of origin from the coronoid. The epitrocleo anoconeus, a small muscle often present, runs from the back of the inner condyle to the olecranon over the ulnar nerve. The flexor digitorum sublimus is placed beneath the previous muscle. It is the largest of the muscles of the superficial group, and arises by three heads, humeral, ulnar, and radial. The humeral head arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, from the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow joint and from the intermuscular septa between it and the preceding muscles. The ulnar head arises from the medial side of the coronoid process above the ulnar origin of the pronator teres. The radial head arises from the oblique line of the radius extending from the radial tuberosity to the insertion of the pronator teres. The muscle speedily separates into two planes of muscular fibers, superficial and deep. The superficial plane divides into two parts which end in tendons for the middle and ring fingers. The deep plane gives off a muscular slip to join the portion of the superficial plane which is associated with the tendon of the ring finger, and then divides into two parts, which end in tendons for the index and little fingers. As the four tendons thus formed pass beneath the transverse carpal ligament into the palm of the hand, they are arranged in pairs, the superficial pair going to the middle and ring fingers, the deep pair to the index and little fingers. The tendons diverge from one another in the palm and form dorsal relations to the superficial volar arch and digital branches of the median and ulnar nerves. Opposite the bases of the first phalanges, each tendon divides into two slips to allow of the passage of the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus. The two slips then reunite and form a grooved channel for the reception of the accompanying 
tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus. Finally, the tendon divides and is inserted into the sides of the second phalanx about its middle. Variations. Absence of radial head, of little finger portion. Accessory slips from ulnar tuberosity to the index and middle finger portions. From the inner head to the flexor profundus. From the ulnar to annular ligament to the little finger. The deep group. Flexor digitorum profundus. Flexor pollicis longus. Pronator quadratus. The flexor digitorum profundus is situated on the ulnar side of the forearm, immediately beneath the superficial flexors. It arises from the upper three-fourths of the volar and medial surfaces of the body of the ulna, embracing the insertion of brachialis above, and extending below to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus. It also arises from a depression on the medial side of the coronoid process, by an aponeurosis from the upper three-fourths of the dorsal border of the ulna, in common with the flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris, and from the ulnar half of the interosseous membrane. The muscle ends in four tendons which run under the transverse carpal ligament dorsal to the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus. Opposite the first phalanges, the tendons pass through the openings in the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus and are finally inserted into the bases of the last phalanges. The portion of the muscle for the index finger is usually distinct throughout, but the tendons for the middle ring and little fingers are connected together by areolar tissue and tendinous slips as far as the palm of the hand. Fibrous Sheaths of the Flexor Tendons after leaving the palm, the tendons of the flexorus digitorum sublimus and profundus lie in osseo aponeurotic canals, formed behind the phalanges and in front by strong fibrous bands, which arch across the tendons, and are attached on either side to the margins of the phalanges. Opposite the middle of the proximal and second phalanges, the bands, digital, vaginal ligaments are very strong, and the fibers are transverse, but opposite the joints they are much thinner, and consist of annular and cruciate ligamentous fibers. Each canal contains a mucous sheath, which is reflected on the contained tendons. Within each canal, the tendons of the flexorus digitorum sublimus and profundus are connected to each other, and to the phalanges by slender tendinous bands called vincula tendina. There are two sets of these. A. The vincula brevia, which are two in number in each finger, and consist of triangular bands of fibers, one connecting the tendon of the flexor digitorum sublimus to the front of the, the first interphalangeal joint and head of the first phalanx and the other the tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus to the front of the second interphalangeal joint and head of the second phalanx. B. The vincula longa, which connect the undersurfaces of the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus to those of the subjacent flexor sublimus after the tendons of the former have passed through the latter. Variations the index finger portion may arise partly from the upper part of the radius. Slips from the inner head of the flexor sublimus, medial epicondyle, or the coronoid are found. Connection with the flexor pollicis longus. Four small muscles, the lumbricals, are connected with the tendons of the flexor profundus in the palm. They will be described with the muscles of the hand. The flexor pollicis longus is situated on the radial side of the forearm, lying in the same plane as the preceding. It arises from the grooved volar surface of the body of the radius, extending from immediately below the tuberosity and oblique line to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus. It arises also from the adjacent part of the interosseous membrane. 
and generally by a fleshy slip from the medial border of the coronoid process or from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The fibers end in a flattened tendon, which passes beneath the transverse carpal ligament, is then lodged between the lateral head of the flexor pollicis brevis and the oblique part of the adductor pollicis, and entering an osseoaponeurotic canal, similar to those for the flexor tendons of the fingers, is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. The volar interosseous nerve and vessels pass downward on the front of the interosseous membrane between the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. Variations. Slips may connect with flexor sublimus or profundus or pronator teres. An additional tendon to the index finger is sometimes found. The pronator quadratus is a small flat quadrilateral muscle extending across the front of the lower parts of the radius and ulna. It arises from the pronator ridge on the lower part of the volar surface of the body of the ulna, from the medial part of the volar surface of the lower fourth of the ulna, and from a strong aponeurosis which covers the medial third of the muscle. The fibers pass lateralward and slightly downward to be inserted into the lower fourth of the lateral border and the volar surface of the body of the radius. The deeper fibers of the muscle are inserted into the triangular area above the ulnar notch of the radius. An attachment comparable with the origin of the supinator from the triangular area below the radial notch of the ulna. Variations Rarely absent Split into two or three layers Increased attachment upward or downward Nerves all the muscles of the superficial layer are supplied by the median nerve, excepting the flexor carpi ulnaris, which is supplied by the ulnar. The pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, and the palmaris longus derive their supply primarily from the sixth cervical nerve, the flexor digitorum sublimus from the seventh and eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves, and the flexor carpi ulnaris from the eighth cervical and first thoracic of the deep layer the flexor digitorum profundus is applied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the ulnar and the volar interosseous branch of the median the flexor pollicis longus and pronator quadratus are supplied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the volar interosseous branch of the median Actions. These muscles act upon the forearm, the wrist, and hand. The pronator teres rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. When the radius is fixed, it assists in flexing the forearm. The flexor carpe radialis is a flexor, an abductor of the wrist. It also assists in pronating the hand and in bending the elbow. The flexor carpi ulnaris is a flexor and adductor of the wrist. It also assists in bending the elbow. The palmaris longus is a flexor of the wrist joint. It also assists in flexing the elbow. The flexor digitorum sublimus flexes first the middle and then the proximal phalanges, and then the proximal phalanges. It also assists in flexing the wrist and elbow. The flexor digitorum profundus is one of the flexors of the phalanges. After the flexor sublimus has bent the second phalanx, the flexor profundus flexes the terminal one, but it cannot do so until after the contraction of the superficial muscle. It also assists in flexing the wrist. The flexor pollicis longus is a flexor of the phalanges of the thumb. When the thumb is fixed, it assists in flexing the wrist. The pronator quadratus rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. End of section 46. Recording by Bologna Times, Tampa, Florida.
of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fasci of the Forearm, Part 2. 2. The Dorsal Antibrachial Muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group, brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum communis, extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor carpi ulnaris, and coneus. The brachioradialis, supinator longus, is the most superficial muscle on the radial side of the forearm. It arises from the upper two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus and from the lateral intermuscular septum, being limited above by the groove for the radial nerve. Interposed between it and the brachialis are the radial nerve and the anastomosis between the anterior branch of the profunda artery and the radial recurrent. The fibers end above the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the styloid process of the radius. The tendon is crossed near its insertion by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. On its honor side is the radial artery. Variations Fusion with the brachialis tendon of insertion may be divided into two or three slips, insertion partial or complete into the middle of the radius, fasciculi to the tendon of the biceps, the tuberosity or oblique line of the radius, slips to the extensor carpi radialis longus or abductor pollicis longus, absence rarely doubled. The extensor carpi radialis longus extensor carpi radialis longeur is placed partly beneath the brachioradialis. It arises from the lower third of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, from the lateral intermuscular septum, and by a few fibers from the common tendon of origin of the extensor muscles of the forearm. The fibers end at the upper third of the forearm in a flat tendon, which runs along the lateral border of the radius beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. It then passes beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, where it lies in a groove on the back of the radius common to it and the extensor carpi radialis brevis, immediately behind the styloid process. It is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the second metacarpal bone on its radial side. The extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis brevior, is shorter and thicker than the preceding muscle beneath which it is placed. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by a tendon common to it and the three following muscles. From the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint, from a strong aponeurosis which covers its surface, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. The fibers end about the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is closely connected with that of the preceding muscle, and accompanies it to the wrist. It passes beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, then beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, and is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the third metacarpal bone on its radial side. Under the dorsal carpal ligament the tendon lies on the back of the radius in a shallow groove, to the ulnar side of that which lodges the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis longus and separated from it by a faint ridge. The tendons of the two preceding muscles pass through the same compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament in a single mucous sheath. Variations. Either muscle may split into two or three tendons of insertion to the second and third or even the fourth metacarpal. The two muscles may unite into a single belly with two tendons. Cross slips between the two muscles may occur. 
The extensor carpi radialis intermedius rarely arises as a distinct muscle from the humerus, but is not uncommon as an accessory slip from one or both muscles to the second or third or both metacarpals. The extensor carpi radialis accessorius is occasionally found arising from the humerus with or below the extensor carpi radialis longus and inserted into the first metacarpal the abductor pollicis brevis, the first dorsal interosseus, or elsewhere. The extensor digitorum communis arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, by the common tendon, from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles, and from the antibrachial fascia. It divides below into four tendons, which pass, together with that of the extensor indices proprius, through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament, within a mucous sheath. The tendons then diverge on the back of the hand, and are inserted into the second and third phalanges of the fingers in the following manner. Opposite the metacarpophalangeal articulation, each tendon is bound by fasciculi to the collateral ligaments and serves as the dorsal ligament of this joint. After having crossed the joint, it spreads out into a broad aponeurosis, which covers the dorsal surface of the first phalanx and is reinforced in this situation by the tendons of the interossei and lumbar callus. Opposite the first interphalangeal joint, this aponeurosis divides into three slips, an intermediate and two collateral. The former is inserted into the base of the second phalanx and the two collateral, which are continued onward along the sides of the second phalanx, unite by their contiguous margins, and are inserted into the dorsal surface of the last phalanx. As the tendons cross the interphalangeal joints, they furnish them with dorsal ligaments. The tendon to the index finger is accompanied by the extensor indices proprius, which lies on its honor side. On the back of the hand, the tendons to the middle, ring, and little fingers are connected by two obliquely placed bands, one from the third tendon passing downward and lateralward to the second tendon, and the other passing from the same tendon downward and medialward to the fourth. Occasionally, the first tendon is connected to the second by a thin transverse band. Variations an increase or decrease in the number of tendons is common. An additional slip to the thumb is sometimes present. The extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor minimi digiti, is a slender muscle placed on the medial side of the extensor digitorum communis, with which it is generally connected. It arises from the common extensor tendon by a thin tendinous slip, from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. Its tendon runs through a compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament behind the distal radio-ulnar joint, then divides into two as it crosses the hand, and finally joins the expansion of the extensor digitorum communis tendon on the dorsum of the first phalanx of the little finger. Variations An additional fibrous slip from the lateral epicondyle the tendon of insertion may not divide or may send a slip to the ring finger. Absence of muscle rare, fusion of the belly with the extensor digitorum communis not uncommon. The extensor carpi ulnaris lies on the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, by the common tendon, by an aponeurosis from the dorsal border of the ulna in common with the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus, and from the deep fascia of the forearm. It ends in a tendon, which runs in a groove between the head and the styloid process of the ulna, passing through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament, and is inserted into the prominent tubercle on the ulnar side of the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. Variations Doubling, reduction to tendinous band, insertion partially into fourth metacarpal. In many cases, 52%, a slip is continued from the insertion of the tendon anteriorly over the opponens digiti quinti to the fascia covering that muscle, the metacarpal bone, 
the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal articulation, or the first phalanx of the little finger. This slip may be replaced by a muscular fasciculus arising from or near the pisiform. The anconeus is a small triangular muscle which is placed on the back of the elbow joint and appears to be a continuation of the triceps brachii. It arises by a separate tendon from the back part of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Its fibers diverge and are inserted into the side of the olecranon and upper fourth of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna. The deep group, supinator, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus, extensor indices proprius. The supinator, supinator brevis, is a broad muscle curved around the upper third of the radius. It consists of two planes of fibers, between which the deep branch of the radial nerve lies. The two planes arise in common, the superficial one by tendinous and the deeper by muscular fibers, from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, from the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint and the annular ligament, from the ridge on the ulna, which runs obliquely downward from the dorsal end of the radial notch, from the triangular depression below the notch, and from a tendinous expansion which covers the surface of the muscle. The superficial fibers surround the upper part of the radius and are inserted into the lateral edge of the radial tuberosity and the oblique line of the radius, as low down as the insertion of the pronator teres. The upper fibers of the deeper plane form a sling-like fasciculus, which encircles the neck of the radius above the tuberosity and is attached to the back part of its medial surface. The greater part of this portion of the muscle is inserted into the dorsal and lateral surfaces of the body of the radius, midway between the oblique line and the head of the bone. The abductor pollicis longus, extensor os metacarpi pollicis, lies immediately below the supinator and is sometimes united with it. It arises from the lateral part of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the insertion of the anconeus, from the interosseous membrane, and from the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the radius. Passing obliquely downward and lateralward, it ends in a tendon, which runs through a groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius, accompanied by the tendon of the extensor pollicis brevis, and is inserted into the radial side of the base of the first metacarpal bone. It occasionally gives off two slips near its insertion, one to the greater multangular bone and the other to blend with the origin of the abductor pollicis brevis. Variations More or less doubling of muscle and tendon with insertion of the extra tendon into the first metacarpal, the greater multangular, or into the abductor pollicis brevis or opponens pollicis. The extensor pollicis brevis extensor primae internatii pollicis, lies on the medial side of, and is closely connected with, the abductor pollicis longus. It arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the radius below that muscle, and from the interosseous membrane. Its direction is similar to that of the abductor pollicis longus, its tendon passing the same groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius, to be inserted into the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. Variations Absence Fusion of tendon with that of the extensor pollicis longus. The extensor pollicis longus, extensor secondi internatii pollicis, is much larger than the preceding muscle, the origin of which it partly covers. It arises from the lateral part of the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the origin of the abductor pollicis longus and from the interosseous membrane. It ends in a tendon, which passes through a separate compartment in the dorsal carpal ligament, lying in a narrow oblique groove on the back of the lower end of the radius. It then crosses obliquely the tendons of the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis, and is separated from the extensor brevis pollicis by a triangular interval, in which the radial artery is found, and is finally inserted into the base of the last phalanx of the thumb. 
the radial artery is crossed by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and of the extensoris pollicis longus and brevis the extensor indices proprius extensor indices is a narrow elongated muscle placed medial to and parallel with the preceding it arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the origin of the extensor pollicis longus and from the interosseous membrane its tendon passes under the dorsal carpal ligament in the same compartment as that which transmits the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis and opposite the head of the second metacarpal bone joins the ulnar side of the tendon of the extensor digitorum communis which belongs to the index finger variations doubling the ulnar part may pass beneath the dorsal carpal ligament with the extensor digitorum communis a slip from the tendon may pass to the index finger nerves the brachioradialis is supplied by the fifth and sixth the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis by the sixth and seventh and the anconeus by the seventh and eighth cervical nerves through the radial nerve the remaining muscles are innervated through the deep radial nerve the supinator being supplied by the sixth and all the other muscles by the seventh cervical actions the muscles of the lateral and dorsal aspects of the forearm which comprise all the extensor muscles and the supinator act upon the forearm wrist and hand they are the direct antagonists of the pronator and flexor muscles the anconeus assists the triceps in extending the forearm the brachioradialis is a flexor of the elbow joint but only acts as such when the movement of flexion has been initiated by the biceps brachii and brachialis the action of the supinator is suggested by its name it assists the biceps in bringing the hand into the supine position the extensor carpi radialis longus extends the wrist and abducts the hand it may also assist in bending the elbow joint at all events it serves to fix or steady this articulation the extensor carpi radialis brevis extends the wrist and may also act slightly as an abductor of the hand the extensor carpi ulnaris extends the wrist but when acting alone inclines the hand toward the ulnar side by its continued action it extends the elbow joint the extensor digitorum communis extends the phalanges then the wrist and finally the elbow it acts principally on the proximal phalanges the middle and terminal phalanges being extended mainly by the interossei and lumbricales it tends to separate the fingers as it extends them the extensor digiti quinti proprius extends the little finger and by its continued action assists in extending the wrist it is owing to this muscle that the little finger can be extended or pointed while the others are flexed the chief action of the abductor pollicis longus is to carry the thumb laterally from the palm of the hand by its continued action it helps to extend and abduct the wrist the extensor pollicis brevis extends the proximal phalanx and the extensor pollicis longus the terminal phalanx of the thumb by their continued action they help to extend and abduct the wrist the extensor indices proprius extends the index finger and by its continued action assists in extending the wrist end of section forty seven recording by selena arter